bugs in here, in there are my eyes. <laughs> yes, thank you, it's great to be here. This is probably going to switch itself off fairly shortly. Wow. Things change, life's change. It's good to be here in this building, but with my family again. And I say, it's great, you know, it's, sorry to get a bit emotional. Anyway, yeah. uh, anyone got any questions? Let's just change the subjects. I usually start going to mechanic parts and to, to get things under control. Anyone got a question straight up? No? Throw it back on you. Oh, well, people often ask, you know, what's the, the, great, the great, you know, what's, what's the greatest thing that God did this year? Or, you know, what's the greatest miracle? Well, I'm here. Yeah. That's a miracle. Yeah. It was one o'clock, one August, uh, I think August 18th, 15th, somewhere there. A couple of gentlemen were breaking into our room. Wake up, the noise that someone's at the door. Gun gets pointed to your head. They remove the magazine clip to confirm it does have ammunition. It's a nine millimeter Beretta. The other guy had a Chinese made uh, 32. First thought, my man, he said, please don't shoot me with that, that'll only hurt. That won't actually kill me. I'll be just stuck with a bullet somewhere. Don't shoot me with a 32. If you're gonna shoot me, shoot me with a nine mil. They proceeded to ransack our room, rob us. We had a couple of Australian visitors. One slept all the way through it. The other one pretended to be asleep, but he was as stiff as a board. So I knew he wasn't asleep, so. So that was an interesting evening. So you sit there and you, you come through it after about an hour. As they leave, they want to take you with them. And they said, no, I'm not going. That's the advantage of being big. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to carry you. They're going to have to put a few things down. <laughs> As the Facebook post says, you know, small people are easy to kidnap, so eat cake. Eat cake. <laughs> so I just said, if you're going to shoot me, just shoot me here. Man up. I'm not going. Sorry. You know, it's a lot easier to find the body here than it is somewhere in the lake. You know, a million thoughts go through your mind. You think of family, you think of loved ones, you think of the people that you're responsible for. But the sun comes up tomorrow. It's only money. It's only money, it's only a camera, it's only a phone iPhone, you can log on and switch it off and it becomes an expensive paperweight. So I don't have many photos with me this time. Somewhere in the middle of Malawi, someone's scrolling through some pictures that aren't theirs, so maybe one day they'll end up on Facebook and we'll catch whoever's got it. So that's a miracle for me. That's a miracle that my wife appreciates. I can't say it was any major, you know, the... You, you kind of wish, where, where are those stories where the, there's people, they see lions and all that? No, we didn't have that. <laughs> we just saw the sun the next day, so that was good. But then you begin to look at things. You, it, it then becomes a challenge internally. You begin to ask, what on earth am I doing here? This is where the battle begins. This is where the battle in the mind begins. And you know, you, the, the, the trauma, the emotion of it, the, uh, the anguish, the pain, the anger, the revenge, all these things you now is something you've got to live with. It's something you've got to process. It's something you've got to, you've got to manage with. And you sit there and say, well, why are we doing it? And then God begins to reveal the miracle of longevity. Wow. 
you as a family, our family here in Mackay, them, from back in the days of Shakespeare Street to the airport. Well, I didn't get to go to the council building, but the senior citizens hall. But this is just buildings. But what's the longevity in, in the hearts of people, in the longevity of the city, in the spirit realm of the city? So that's a, the journey of longevity. That's a journey that you're on. That's a passion. That's a family. That's what God takes you through individually and corporately. And for us, we, you know, we can see the fruits of longevity. We see the fruits of a little consistency over a long time produces a great pearl. It's a tiny, it's a tiny speck of sand in the heart of the pearl that creates that consistency where something to lay down season after season, that, 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 that nacre, that, 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 that perfectness, that, that, that inspiration, that, that the heart of God produced something, a pearl of great price. You know, one of the, the, the classic uh, manifestation I shared in one of the, 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 one of the last um, newsletters, Tomorrow, there's a picture of a baby, a miracle baby. The chaplaincy in Kabwe. Now, this mother came into the hospital. She's four months pregnant. She's PET, preeclampsia toxemia. Her blood pressure's in the 200s. She's already had, already passed out once. The, the, the threat of a stroke is imminent. Not possible, but imminent. She's a young girl. It's a teenage pregnancy. The doctor said, well, this is simple. It's abortion. It's abortion to save the mother's life. This girl will not survive. Cries out to God. Someone calls for the chaplain. The chaplain team come and they pray. The blood pressure normalises. The urine and the, the protein in the urine stops. Every medical magazine, every medical document says preeclampsia pre toxemia is only cured through delivery or abortion. Six weeks ago, she delivered. <laughs> Not a single one. See, it's the longevity of having chaplains in a hospital. That when hospital staff and hospital people realise when medicine finishes, God takes over. Because it takes time. It takes time to create that culture. It takes time to create that, that longevity that people begin to trust. It takes time for the people to step back and, and rely on God and have faith in God even though they're not people that walk in faith. Because it takes a knowing. And that's, that what comes with longevity is that people begin to know you're not here today and gone tomorrow. There's a consistency. And that's what God's looking for, is a consistency. In season and out of season. In good and in bad. You know, we've, we've started working with the, the, the hospital in Indola. And for the last few years, we've been putting a, a fair percentage of the, the equipment that comes into the indola based hospitals. So this year, they, they've just gone from just a few people ministering on the Sunday through the wards. They've been said, well, let's put a call out to the, the churches. Let's do a, a corporate training. They had over 150 people turn up for training. We now have a team of 50 people in that hospital every Sunday representing over 15 churches and three ministries. Because that's the fruit of longevity. It's not a case of just turning up one year, making a donation, it's over, let's move on to the next one. It's that year in, year out, year in, year out consistency. Where you can walk into a... It's in, the, in that city now you're getting a network of churches working together with a common heart to preach the gospel. Because just like that young girl, day in, day out, there are people every single day 
They cry out to Jesus. Because when medicine stops, Jesus is the only answer. You know, there's, a, there's been a group of pastors that, even from when Pastor Ken's been there, from, for the whole time that we've been there, even from the people from the Salisbury's been working with and, and, and doing outreaches and church planning with. You know, we're talking decades. This year we saw one of them, not just one of them, but collectively the, the, they, they're starting, that they have their own Bible school where they've written their, basically a lot of the material going into the churches, into the regions themselves, training up their own leaders, training up in the gospel, but one that's relevant to them, one that's the, the lessons that are relevant to them, relevant to their culture. We see that not only just grow from one group of pastors, but begin to spread across different regions of the country, across different church movements, whether it's brethren, whether it's AOG, whether it's Baptists. Going past the, getting into an area of maturity. That it's about the gospel, it's about reaching the lost. It's not about doctrine, it's not about banners, it's not about names, it's about the lost. And you see that not only go from different regions and different church movements, but now to go to different countries. Go into Malawi, into Mozambique with us to go into Congo and other nations. That comes from year in, year out. Being consistent, even if it's only a little. It's the smallest grain of sand that makes the pearl. And it's the pearl that remains within the oyster the longest that grows the biggest. And that's what our life's got to be like. There's got to be consistency. You know, there's, a, there's a planting, there's a, there's a tapping in from which we stand. And there are times in our life that you will get a Macedonian call. Like even Paul was called, he, he, he was outreaching, he was called to go into Macedonia. It didn't mean he stayed in Macedonia. It didn't mean his whole ministry remained in Macedonia. But to him, it did something for him. It gave him a measuring stick. It gave him a yardstick. And that's how we are with ourselves. Is it's, we often forget how, how little and how our consistency year in, year out has a major impact. But that's how it is. So uh, let me share from the, the gospel before I get all fleshy. Uh, if we put it up in the, uh, Mark chapter 10. We got that up there? Where are they? This is a wonderful children's church story. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. You know, the other areas have been very happy with, uh, you know, you, you be married for over a decade, you begin to realise my wife is a pioneer. Uh, I'm glad she's in one way she's not here today because I get to share about what she does because if, if she's here, I can't. It comes with consequences. <laughs> it's a very quiet ride home from church. <laughs> so you're going to have to cut this off on the sound bite. <laughs> I won't tell her it's up. That's the easiest way. So my wife, a couple of years ago, Started, um, it's it's a it's a group it's a program organised by Plan. Uh, the Catholics use it a lot. So basically, she starts by having an outreach amongst the women of her community, the ladies in the street. Gets them round for some snacks, a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, and then they all get together. And over the years, then they join what's called a savings and loans club. So basically a group of no more than 40 women. They meet once a week uh, where they bring their deposits. Uh, they make deposits and record it in like a little bank book. Then the group is encouraged throughout the year they've got to take a minimum of three loans. And the loan 
is paid back over three months, and it's quite high interest, it's 20% interest over those three months. So the, the women get together, they get there, and they begin to make businesses. And those businesses are self-funded in that everyone makes the deposits and everyone has a turn borrowing money to go begin to start business and they all work together and they all do life together and, you know, Angie comes home from the meetings and she begins to share with me some of the goings on and, and, and it's like home and away, summer bay. <laughs> One thing I've also learned is when she tells you stuff, she's not looking for an answer. <laughs> Unless she says, what do you think we should do? If you don't hear those words, what do you think we should do? Shut up. <laughs> Just listen. No matter how funny the story seemed to get, and for those who know or know what I'm talking about, it's not about the nail. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up, but it's not about the nail. So she gets together. So she's been doing that. She did that where we used to live in the suburb called Dallas and now where we live in Kalonga. So last year or this year, her group in Kalonga... Uh, did his 12-month course. They, the 32 women had a collective savings of about $14,000. That's not bad for 32 women in Africa. So that group now is 70. There's a Friday group and a Saturday group. You know, it's, it's, it's not a church group. It's not a home group. It's a group of women doing life together. Some are Catholic, some are Seventh Day, some are Jehovah's Witness, some have no belief. One lady's a Muslim. But they all get together and they do life. And in that, there's opportunity to share, there's opportunity to outreach, there's opportunity to be there for one another. And they all put in a little bit extra Every week they do a little bit of fundraising so when there is a funeral those ladies are there to cook meals for the funeral home. They're there, they're known, they have their uniform, they, they have together, they do life. It's, it's not those. So Angie's been elevated into regional coordinator because every time she starts a group it seems to double in size. So I'm very proud of Angie. The, the week in, week out of getting together, we see this year we will see the 70 women collectively may raise savings of over $40,000. So in our community, there is no more, no, no more children not going to school. In our community, we start seeing there is no times at meal times that there's nothing on the food or the table. It's collectively women doing life together. Because evangelism begins at your doorstep. And it's that week in, week out contact. We can see the same with uh, Chankosa. It's where we've done numerous outreaches and we started helping building a little, a little clinic and a school and stuff. We don't have a church there. It's a community outreach. But every time I go there, you can even hear in their heart, you can hear in the language, the whole community is beginning to transform. The alcoholism is being reduced. Education is being lifted. Health is being lifted. Everything is there. And you know what? I don't even have to say it. They know it's because of God. Amen. They give God the glory. You know... I get embarrassed when I see pictures of it because it, she, she's pretty rough. To say it's agricultural would be wrong because it's not even that close our class. But you sit there and say, well, we do have a budget of $50 a month, so that's what $50 a month builds for that. But this year we built a shop. Now that community is now supporting their four teachers that are donating that time. Now, in that community, the first time, they got four people going to university to be trained as teachers. In that community, this year was the first year they had a group of grade sevens go and sit the national exam to go to high school. 
You know, in, in, in that community, we now have all the children being inoculated for diseases that there is vaccines for. It's the little. Consistently. Year in, year out. Week in, week out. They make the difference. We now have nurses ringing us saying, we haven't been there for four weeks or five weeks. We need to go. I have staff members that just picked a vehicle and just took them out and did a medical outreach and I didn't organise a thing. It just happens. And that happens because of consistency. So we read there in the Bible, it says, Now they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, and blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And we heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then, they ma then many warned him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and he came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Raboni, he must be an Italian, eh? Raboni, that I may receive sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. That's a classic. Anyone got some coins, like three 20 cent pieces, a couple of 10 cent pieces? I'll get you to give me those. This is a... We can leave it up. Yep, leave it up. Now, this is a, a... Yeah, cool. Just need a few. Just to make noise. I'll go for that. You know, it's funny how different sounds promote different things. For me, a cowbell means ice cream. Because we have little guys on bicycles with cowbells, ringing cowbells when they're selling ice creams. So you can be in your car waiting for another member of the family, which we wait a lot for. You hear a cowbell, dong, 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 dong. We know it's ice cream time. And the other one is this. This is street kids selling water, coconut, something like that. They do it better, they. So here we have blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Often in scripture, when they talk about people being healed, we don't know who they name. They don't give an, they're not given a name. But here we know who he is and who he's the son of. And he's outside the city. And there's a lot in these scriptures that, that is very much, we're it. We're almost every part of this story. We could be like Bartimaeus and that we have a need. And we're, we're, we're in a desperate place for that miracle. And here he is at the side, he's at the gate. And as we read through, there's a, there's a few points that we pick up and he says, he's sitting at the gate beautiful. Or not the gate, but he's sitting at the gate. And he hears that Jesus is coming. He doesn't hear Jesus. He's just, he's blind. So he, he must hear people saying, you can hear that he sits at the gate every single day. So his sound is there. We even see him in our supermarkets. What do you see outside of Wolves and Coles? There's the Blind Dogs Association. It's the Coast Guard. Nothing's changed. At the gate of trading... We allocate in society places for those to beg for alms. It hasn't changed. You'll see World Vision with their store. You'll see Guide Dogs with their store. You'll see Lifesavers with their store. You'll see nothing's changed. They may not be at the city gates, but they're at the gates. They're at the, the entrance to the supermarkets. 
And society, we've put them in that position. You know, you have a need. We understand you have a need, so you have a rightful place to be here. It's acceptable for you to be here. This is your station. This is your allocation. This is how you edge out. This is where we select for you to be. Bartimaeus is is the same. Society, the church, whoever it is, has says, it's okay, this is, we know you're blind, so your position is to sit outside the gates and beg for alms. So he's sitting there and he's heard of the stories. And today he hears a ruckus. He hears something different. There's, there's a noise different to the clinking of his coins. He finds out it's Jesus, so he calls out, Jesus! Have mercy on me. And those around him say, shh. You've got your place. Your place is here. Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus stops. He doesn't say, Bartimaeus, come. He turns to the people around him, calling. Turns to the disciples, go call him. Turns to the people there, go call him. We are those people. You could be in the same position, Bartimaeus, and need God to, you're calling out, Jesus. Have mercy on me. Or maybe you're one of the ones following Jesus. Jesus hears the cry, but he turns to those with him. Call him. Jesus is talking to you. Call them. Because they've heard about me. And we see that week in, week out with the hospital. People turn up to a hospital, they're sick. They're crying out to Jesus. Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. In a normal hospital situation, the world would say, you're here. Quiet. We'll give you some medicine. We'll, we'll do some tests. We'll, we'll find out what's wrong with you. But when you have chaplains, when you have people in hospitals where where the gospel goes out, where people, their testimonies are alive every single day of the greatness of God. Jesus, have mercy on me. And each and every one of us are in that position. For Jesus to turn around and say, call them. Because we all know someone. We all walk through the gates. We all hear the cries of need. Jesus turning to each and every one of us. Call them. Jesus could have gone over to him and to himself and said, Bartimaeus, I know who you are. I know everybody, I know everything. I've come here today. To heal you. And that's what we expect Jesus to do. Sometimes that's what we wait for in our own life. We're waiting for our miracle, but we're also waiting for Jesus to turn up and to to come and say, I know, Uh, yeah, 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 I, I heard you, I know. But Jesus didn't go to Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. He said to those who were around him, call him. You and I are that person. Jesus is saying to us, call him. That's how you build a church. That's how you build a church. That's how you you bring people to Christ because people all around us Well, I'm throwing your money away. I better give you your money back. 
Good night. And we're that person. It's Jesus that heals him. It's our job to just say, hey, be of good cheer. He is calling you. Is that not the gospel message? Be of good cheer. I have good news for you. God is calling you. He has heard your cries. He has called you to come. Come. And we see Bartimaeus' response and quite often we miss this. See, in those times, lepers and anyone in that position that was given a place to beg for alms, the church gave him a cloak that signified position and state of uncleanliness. So they say, Bartimaeus, be of good cheer, rise, be of good cheer. He's calling you. He stands up. He undoes the cloak. They say, I am no longer bound to what society says who I am. I reject that. Jesus has called me. And that's what happens when we call people. You know, diagnosis. You can get a diagnosis for a disease and you put that cloak on. You wear that cloak. You live with that condition because society, doctors, technology, diagnosis has given you that cloak. And as long as you wear that cloak, you can get that sympathy. You have a a social right, a political right to be at the gates. I'm a cancer sufferer. Or I'm a single mum. Or I have this disease. I have that disease. I have this condition. I've been diagnosed. I've been given that cloak. And as long as I wear that cloak, society's happy with me wearing this cloak because that's the position, that's the allocation we've given you. But Jesus calls. The cloak gets heavy. Yes, I can take a position in society. I can sit here and society will give me everything I need. If I just sit here, I'm accepted. My condition says I'm accepted. I'm allowed to be here because I have this or because I am this or because, because... But they hear. They hear the testimonies of Jesus. People outside that door, they hear about Jesus. They hear the wonder of Jesus, whether that's by, by, any, by any and every means. And finally, finally, Jesus, have mercy on me. I've had enough. But it takes someone to sit there and say, be of good cheer, rise. He's calling you. That's our job. That's our job. You may be Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. You may be in that need of that miracle, that breakthrough. But as Bartimaeus stood up, he took off. That diagnosis. He took off that station and he left and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Today, Jesus is asking you, what do you want me to do for you? But have you left the cloak? Have you turning to Jesus with that cloak still on? Or are you answering Jesus with that cloak of what everyone's given you to wear? Are you willing to leave it go? Leave it at the gate. 
And when Jesus asks you, what do you want? Give him an honest answer. Not give him an answer that your fundraising for Surf Lifesavers gives you. Don't give him the answer of the, what the cloak would have you have in Gansa. I want to receive my sight. Jesus answered, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Instantly, instantly he was healed and he followed Jesus. This is the gospel. But this is the gospel today. For us, this is what it looks like. For us, our strategy, our, uh, our cunning plan is to get into hospitals, to open up the door for chaplains to tell the story, to, to pray for the sick, to see the people get healed, people set, get set free. So within that institution, there's a noise, there's a background noise about God's greatness. So that when people come, they hear the noise. They, they, they've heard the rumours. They've heard the stories. They've heard the testimonies. So that when the chaplain or the, someone of the chaplain's team is wandering through the hospital, Jesus, have mercy on me. I've heard. So that's the schools. Other times we work in schools. Work into a community. Gives us that opportunity to, yes, the front, we see education, we see health, we see people grow and extend, we see poverty begin to break down. But in that, in amongst that, for us, there's the stories. People hear of the greatness of Jesus. They hear the testimonies of, of being set free. They, they hear the testimonies. They, they, it's around them. So that when someone comes and they say that someone has brought Jesus or someone comes by, it gives us the opportunity to say, he is calling you. Come. For us, that's what it looks like. And we, 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 we will continue to do it. And you know, but none of this some of this never happens overnight. A lot of this, and like a, like a journey that Ken's been on in this, the, this movement, this church, even before Ken, like even before us, there was Ernest Salisbury, then there was Dave Salisbury, then there was Sam Salisbury, then there was Chris Shadbolt. We all have our surname start with S. That's probably the only common ground. And we're white-ish. But that makes nothing. But it's time. It's commitment. Eternity is a long time. This life on earth is short. But we've got to be there every single day. You know, God's not an insurance program. He's not a life insurance that at the end, you know, we call upon Jesus, I get a disease, I call upon Jesus, he either makes me better, if he doesn't make me better, I go to heaven. It's all good. Jesus isn't that. Jesus wants us to be the ones he turns to and says, call him. Call him. Call her. I've heard their cry. I have stopped. Bring them. What do you want? That's us. Now we'll push on into Malawi. We have a heart to see where we are at Kabwe. We'll see that grow and develop to be like that in Ndola, Siavonga, and other rural areas. We want to see that take off in Malawi, Lilongwe Base Hospital, half a million. Half a million patients a year. That's 
That's a lot of jiggling coins. As a missionary and as an evangelist, you walk into that. Some people come in and they hear the crying, they smell the smells, they, they, hear, they hear the trauma, they see the trauma. I walk into it and I hear, Jesus, Son of God, Son of da- Jesus, have mercy on me. I can hear the clinking of coins. I don't need a team of 50. I need a team of 300 to be the ones and say he's calling you. He's calling you. Nigeria is the same. Situations change. It's persecution. It's the same. It's the same. Okay, there's Islam and there's killing and there's burning and setting churches on fire. There's all that. Just people cry a little bit louder. Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. To be there, to have teams of people to say, He's calling you. He's calling you. Stand up, rise. Be of good cheer. Your hour has come. He's calling you. For us, that's what it looks like. You know, that's that's as a church and as a heart, that's that's what you've invested, that's what that's what you've been a part of. But it's not separate. It's a part. It's like Neapolitan ice cream. We're just the chocolate side of that ice cream cup. But there's still other flavours. There's, there's still the Mackay flavour. There's still a Vanuatu flavour. Maybe it's rainbow. Maybe there's more than three colours. So as much as it's very real for me, it's also very real for you. You know, don't, don't despise the, the small beginnings. It's the smallest grain of sand that makes the most valuable pearl. And it's that sand over a long time that creates the pearl of great price. These disciples that called Bartimaeus only had to call him. It was Jesus who set him free. It was Bartimaeus' faith and Jesus' authority that made the difference. Don't discount yourself because you don't think you've got enough faith. You've just got to connect the dots. You've heard the stories. You've heard the testimonies. You know Jesus is the answer. Rise up. He's calling you. That's the gospel message. That's what you carry. Amen? Amen. That's all I've got to say about that. Awesome. Can I have the music team come, please? And Chris mentioned the hospital in Malawi at Lilongwe. Is it Lilongwe? Lilongwe. Um, we, there is a chaplain there because of the last container. And they're like bulldozers that go in. They have massive impact. And on the ground here in Mackay, we have our next shipping container. It's going there. It's, ready, it's nearly ready to go. Um, so what I want you to do is pray f- that the funding will come. It's quite a challenge to sh- ship a container. It's, it's about $15,000 to get it there. But at what price can you compare? the impact, half a million people coming to that hospital to be healed, to be saved, what an outreach. And it's sitting on the ground here and God's just about filled it, It's, it's overflowing with stuff. I have no idea what it's worth. 
but I just know it's going to go because God wants it there. It's going to make its way to Malawi and it's going to the long way and it's going to that hospital. And that chaplain will receive it on behalf of TTN and Operation Lift, which is just two mates who made a cunning plan. That's all it is. And a lot of other people that are involved now. So pray for the container. Pray the funding will come at the right time and it will get on that water and it will have favour from Mackay to Malawi all the way there and those goods will be distributed and people will be amazed but more than that the spirit world will open up the way for the gospel to reach half a million people a year and may the Christians in that town rise up and join this ministry team with the chaplain who needs a lot of people around him to reach these people. And be like Tamara in Kabwe who we sent some funds to recently who sends 70% of the hospital home on Mondays because they're healed. That's a good discharge. Would you stand to your feet please? We